Hello and welcome to this insight session with Darren Coleman. My name is Hannah. I am with APCOM by SCM. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an intro and some housekeeping during this webinar. Then I will pass you on to Darren for the actual webinar. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us. As attendees, you're automatically muted, meaning we can neither see nor hear you. You can, however, use the chat box to write in any questions you might have. And towards the end of the session with Darren, time permitting, hopefully we'll be able to answer as many questions as we possibly can. So I will now hand you over to Darren. I'll turn off my camera and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Hannah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here. My name is Darren Coleman. I run a branding agency that's based in the UK called Wavelength. We specialize in working with services brands, banks, insurance companies, airlines, people like that. So we get involved with a lot of the behavioral elements of building brands, which invariably rolls into internal communications. So today, what I'd like to do is to provide some data-driven insights and practical advice on how to craft engaging brand values. So this talk will help you in several ways. First, I want to focus your efforts via three pieces of brand values advice. So I want to give you three practical takeaways that you can start thinking about and working with on your teams straight after this talk. I also want you to appreciate why brand values are especially important during this time of COVID-19. Off the back of that, I want to share some practical advice based on my 20, 25 years global experience for the characteristics of great brand values. And that will roll into a case study with a mid-cap investment bank that we've worked with, where we used a data-driven approach to craft their brand values. So really, through that example, and through the, the five pointers for how to craft great brand values, I want you to be able to engage key stakeholders, employees, but also other people that will interact with your brand, and ultimately help you go away from this talk so that you can use brand values to galvanize your organization during these turbulent times. So my three pieces of advice. We're currently in very turbulent times and the future is a bit like looking at that road ahead. There's a kind of a path, a journey that we can take, but the mist is clouding the clarity of the route. So it's hard to be precise, but these are my three bits of advice. Firstly, evaluate your brand values. Are they great? I'm going to give you some advice on what great brand values should look like. And do they resonate with your stakeholders, your employees, your customers, investors, even people within the C-suite? Secondly, I'm going to advise you to use data in a balanced way. And that means using qualitative and quantitative data, but also internal and external insights to shape the brand values that you have. It's important to be very clear with the data so that you can define and fine tune your values as you go through time. So when it comes to articulating your brand values, actually the process of creating those values can be more important than the actual output. And the case study that I talk you through will show you why that is the case. But I'll also advocate that you use a scientific approach primarily to get the C-suite on site. Then, in terms of communications, I'd encourage you to opt a nuanced approach to values-based communication. So at the moment, there are a multitude of factors outside of your control. But one thing that you can have control over is your values and how they are conveyed and communicated. At different moments in time, over the next six, 12 to 18 months, those values will be more or less important. So it's important that you amplify or tone down communications of those values, depending on the context that presents itself. So the values will help you to connect at a human level. So if there's one thing that all marketers have learned during the recent onslaught of COVID-19, is that humans seek out human connection and values enable us to connect at a human level. So the coronavirus context, they're turbulent times. People are looking for support, comfort, 
safety, reassurance, and even relief, just to lift the spirits during these difficult times we're encountering. And that applies to your employees who are quite frequently the forgotten half of marketing, but also stakeholders as well, investors, supply chain, your customers, people in the local community. So people are experiencing these challenges during these turbulent times. And brand values are powerful because they can provide support, they can comfort people, they can give people safety in the context that they find themselves, they can provide reassurance and relief if you can bring a bit of humour to your brand. So in this sense, we're finding with our clients that values are coming into sharper focus. So here's the first question, please, Hannah. So during this time of COVID-19, I think brand values have become more important. Please select one option. Yes, no, not sure, don't know. Okay, about 80% of the participants have voted so far. Okay, great. Can we see the results? 90%, yes. Here are the results. Great. So 90% brand values have become more important. 23% saying not sure. Zero saying no. And not zero, don't know. So the clear message there is brand values have become more important during this time. If we can flip back to the other content, Hannah. Sure. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. So my question here as a bit of you know, sarcasm, British sarcasm is, have you heard about the chocolate fire guard? Well, you're probably looking at me thinking, what is he talking about? Is he completely insane? Well, the point here is that regrettably, a lot of brand values are like chocolate fire guards, pretty much useless. So what I want to do now is provide you with some practical advice on how to craft great brand values. So, based on my experience with 20, 25 years global branding experience, brand values have a number of characteristics, five characteristics that are best approached in two phases. Firstly, brand values should be unique, specific, active and deliberate. So by unique, I mean that they need to be distinctive. So quality or professionalism are generic, they're not unique. Many moons ago, we worked with a, a professional services firm in Southeast Asia, and they had a value of being empathetic. This chimed with local sensitivities and also resonated with employees within the business. You also want your values to be specific. So for example, Brand values such as, be, as quality or professionalism, they're very broad. Quality to you and quality to me could mean very different things. So maybe it's better to reframe your value of quality as being diligent. Values need to be framed actively. The reason being whether you like it or not, values endeavor to compel behavioral change. By that, I mean values look to encourage you to buy more, buy less, go here, go there, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. But a lot of values go in at the behavioral level. So for example, teamwork isn't a value. Teamwork is a behavior. A value that compels teamwork behavior is something such as being collaborative, emotionally intelligent, or empathetic. The reason being, being collaborative results in teamwork. So you need to focus on cause, not effect, to compel behavioral change. 
then you also want to make sure that your values are deliberate. So this means that your values need to have um, the characteristics of, of, of a family, of a closely knit unit, so they work together and they act like brothers and sisters. But at the same time, you don't want your values to overlap. So for example, if you have two values of being caring and sincere, you may want to trade in one of those values as caring and sincere can result in similar outcomes. So once you've thought about the extent to which your values are unique, specific, active and deliberate, the next stage is to come up for air. And you need to think about the extent to which your values are balanced. And by that, I mean you want your values to be functional and emotional, core and peripheral. So the function delivers on core benefits, reliability, dependability, things like that. The emotional element relates to prestige, self-actualization, belonging, these sorts of things. At a core level, these are the values that won't change. So for example, at the core of the body shop brand, there's been a value about being socially responsible. But if you think about brands like Bentley, they've become less refined and bolder with time, as has, been reflect, as has been reflected in their communications. So the point here is you want to have balance between a value in one of each of those quadrants, or a maximum of five spanning those quadrants. And what that means in practical terms is that your values will resonate functionally and emotionally today and they can also be fine-tuned via the peripheral values so they retain relevance whereas the core values are the bedrock that won't change and that means that your brand won't be a moving target so based on my experience great brand values have five characteristics they're unique they're specific they're active they're deliberate and they're balanced So how to adopt a data-driven approach within the context of those five characteristics? So this is my second question, Hannah. Yeah. Paul, starting now. So the question is, data influence, how our brand values were created. So select one of the following. Yes, no, not sure, don't know. Okay, about 70% of the participants have voted, 80% now. Okay, so we close the poll and show the results. Here we are. Influence, 55%, 18% no, 18% not sure. So a good 45% there. To the best of your knowledge, they have not taken a data-driven approach or haven't taken a data-driven approach. So thanks for that, Hannah, very interesting. So now if we move back, what I want to do is share a practical example from a client that we worked with that adopted a data-driven approach to crafting their brand values. So the client, they were a mid-cap investment bank, they had operations across Europe, and they also had deep partnerships in the US and in mainland China. The challenges were threefold. Firstly, there was growth and fragmentation. So the business was reaching a plateau and it was growing so quickly that they couldn't ensure a consistent experience was being delivered to their clients and the culture within the business was being diluted. So that meant we needed to get back to basics and crystallize the values internally so people had a guiding principle for how to go about behaving. The second challenge related to language. They didn't want to use any words relating to brand. So we had to call this a values and behavior project because the minute anything brand related came up in conversation, people's eyes rolled and they thought this was just brand jargon. So ultimately, they were skeptical. They didn't think that brands and values, brand values drove performance and delivered to the bottom line. 
So these were the three challenges that we were presented with. And the solution lay in articulating clear values. So they had a guiding principle for recruiting, inducting, training and rewarding employees, but also delivering internal and external communications that could be executed consistently and with cohesion. We avoided all jargon, any brand related lingo, any brand related terms, we just removed it. And the approach was very consultative. So we almost mentored and guided and coached key members of the organization that were the ambassadors for the project through the process. So then they could take the message into the organization. And that approach was very data driven, as I'm about to explain. So the project was broken down into four stages. There was the discovery stage where we obtained the insights, the consolidate where we made decisions about the values in addition to other facets of the brand and the project. Then we created the plan and then we launched through communications, noticeably internal communications first, followed by external communications because this was a B2B services brand that was crucial that we informed and educated the organization, so we took them with us. So the discovery stage is what I want to focus on now. And the process that we followed was qualitative, internally and externally. So the internal qual insights were via a series of facilitative workshops. The qualitative external was via a series of Skype face-to-face -face interviews. Then we ramp that up via internal and external quantitative surveys to validate the qualitative exploratory findings with a larger sample. And as we went through the whole process, there was ongoing frequent open communication up and down the organization. And this is what I mean when I said earlier, the process of actually articulating the values and creating the values frequently is more important than the actual values that you arrive at. The engagement and the education is key so that the values are everyone's values and they haven't been imposed. So how do we do this? So what we did is we created a number of workshops, facilitated workshops. And as you can see along the bottom there, we're quite small teams. And on the back of the wall, we had a very large canvas that was two meters by one and a half meters that went through certain activities. And if you see here at the top left, we actually started to ask questions about the values. And there were other elements about the feelings and points of difference. But you can see that the teams here worked very carefully through these activities. And we even created a visual language to engage these skeptical financiers. So we used a magnet as a visual language to symbolize that values can draw people in and push them away. So this was the first stage where we went around on a roadshow around Europe, key stakeholders and obtained their views on the values in addition to other parts of the project. And then what we did is we replicated those questions via a series of one-to-one -one interviews over Skype. And we, we took sound bites. So this was one lawyer from Denmark, and this is what he had to say. They, they should be able to adjust to, to target. Hmm? Not the same solution every, every time. So we took sound bites from the interviews. So adjust doesn't really work as a value, but flexible does. So we took these sound bites, reframed them as values, but we also used these insights, these audio insights, to share with the C-suite and across the organization so they could hear their customer or other stakeholders' views. And it stopped people in their tracks because it resonated deeply because they could hear and feel the emotions coming from these key, stake, key stakeholders. So this was about being client focused, etc. But the point was that previously skeptical 
senior executives and members of the board could hear the voice of the customer and engage them, very much so. So the key findings, we broke them down, and this is a summary, I couldn't share everything, but the existing values, so internally there were words like ambitious, collaborative, specialised coming out, external of the ideal existing values would be personable, client focused, flexible, adaptable, and there was some overlap between perceptions of existing values internally and externally. When we looked at the ideal values, which is what we were really trying to work for to make them aspirational, internal values such as being successful and ambitious were coming out. So internally people were saying, yeah, I think the ideal values are to be successful and ambitious. Externally, ideal values were things like being personable, flexible, adaptable and hardworking, with some overlap between internal and external views for ideal values such as professional and knowledgeable. And what you can see is for the existing values, there was limited alignment. For the ideal values, there was a larger level of alignment. But for internal values here and here, there was limited alignment between the ideal and the external. But interestingly, for views externally, for the existing values and the ideal values, there was some alignment. So the next stage was to try and validate those views via a larger survey. So through the qualitative stage, we obtained the answers to the surveys. So obtained the answers to the survey questions that we then validated through surveys that were translated and reverse translated to ensure accuracy across a number of languages. These were just the snapshot. So then what we did is we used those responses from the surveys, which themselves were based on the qualitative stage to identify which of the values drove performance metrics that were of interest to the organization. So the performance metrics that were of specific interest to this client were recommendations, reputation, do business again, trust, and relative satisfaction. So what we found was that the value of being personable drove recommendation, reputation, doing business, trust, and satisfaction. We found that being adaptable drove recommendations, reputation, and relative satisfaction. Then we found being flexible drove recommendation and trust, and we found that being specialized drove reputation. So all of these were responses were significant, highly significant, and the model itself was significant as well. So what this enabled us to do was to go back to the organization and say, right, based on the values that represent the ideal, these are the ones that drive performance. Personable, adaptable, trustworthy, and then to a lesser extent, flexible and specialized. Being client focused, excuse me, being client focused, proactive, progressive, pragmatic, they didn't drive performance. So they're of no interest. So this really piqued the interest of our financial client here. The next stage was then we'd identified the values that drive performance, but we needed to understand how aligned they were internally and externally. So the values that drove performance were being adaptable, specialized, trustworthy, personable, and flexible. So we could forget the next values. And what we could see here is based on the sample, there was quite a lot of alignment in terms of the attitude towards these ideal values. But some of the alignment wasn't statistically significant and some of it was. So for example, being personable and adaptable was there was no statistical significance, the difference. So the alignment was there. Internally and externally, people were focused. But there was some statistical significant statistically significant differences between the internal and the external views of being trustworthy, flexible, and specialized. And what that meant 
is that the focus of internal communications needed to really help the organization understand the importance of those values and how it's important to reflect those values as they have an influence on key performance metrics. So if I go back to my three pieces of advice based on the five criteria that I outlined and that data-driven client example, the future holds uncertainty, but one thing you can have some control over is your values and how you bring them to life. So go back and are they great? Are they specific, unique, etc.? Do they resonate internally and externally? Use data, qualitative and quantitative, internal and external, to ensure that it's balanced. Define those values or fine tune those values based on data. This will remove some of the skepticism and add some science to your approach and help you command credibility and respect and have clout in the C-suite. So the process is frequently more important than the output itself, and that's why the engagement is so key. And I would advise a values-based communications, internally and externally, that's nuanced. So based on your values, you can fine tune, ramp up or tone down certain values that deliver against certain metrics. So for example, trust is really important now. So communications internally and externally should focus on that, but connect at a human level through your values. So hopefully now you can see how I've arrived at those three bits of advice through guidance on how to articulate great brand values and the case study. So the talk, what I wanted to do was to help you appreciate why values are important. The world is turbulent. Values provide a way of giving some stability and connecting at a human emotional level. Understand the five characteristics of values, how you can adopt a data-driven approach, but also to engage key stakeholders, employees, the C-suite, senior management, external partners, so that your brand values are relevant and resonate both internally and externally. But the idea is that you use those values to galvanize your organization. They should be the glue that binds. So the difficult times, and this gentleman here, Sir Tom, has become a bit of a superstar in the UK. He raised 35 million pounds for the NHS by walking up and down his garden a hundred times, and he's a hundred. So he said, the sun will shine on you and the clouds will go away. I realize they're difficult times, but stick at, stick at it. The clouds will go away. So that's it. Thank you. Keep in touch. We've got some time for some questions. And the best question, I'll be happy to send you a digital copy of my book. Hannah, over to you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much for doing this webinar with us. Um, there are no questions so far. If you have any questions for Darren at all, please do share them with us in the chat box. Okay. Still no questions. Is there anything you would like to add, Darren? Uh, my advice at this stage would keep things simple. When it comes to articulating your brand values, I would go back to those five criteria. And, and reflect on the extent to which your values are unique, specific, deliberate, et cetera. And then once you have, revisit those values with data and start internally to ensure that people understand and engage and obtain their views, but then also come up for air and sense check how relevant those values are to key external stakeholders, but also tie them in with some performance metrics because a stakeholder or the employees may say, yeah, we think being dependable is an important value, but the question is, so what? You need to tie the value of, for example, being dependable in with a performance metric. And that's where you'll get real influence in your organization because people will believe in those values. Right, thanks. Okay, since there are still no questions, I suggest we 
just call it a day. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much again, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Darren, for this very, very informative webinar session. Our next session starts at 3.30. Um, Francisco Lalan will provide insights into Trivago's company culture in times of crisis. Please find the respective registration link in the chat box. Thank you and enjoy the rest of our web conference.